Hey, What Next listener, before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little bit later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Right now, the Manatee Bay Elementary School, just outside Fort Lauderdale, Florida, has got a problem. The problem is measles. The measles outbreak in Broward spreading. Nine cases now confirmed, seven connected to Manatee Bay Elementary in Weston. Measles is actually spreading around the country, with cases popping up in 15 states, from New Jersey to California. If the cases keep rising, the superintendent said it will be up to the state to act, but he finds it strange to be dealing with a disease that was nearly eradicated. You know, personally, but what's happening in Florida is a little different. It's a wake-up call in a community that has been left on edge following these cases. To start, it helps to remember how big of a deal measles is. It is one of the most infectious pathogens in the world. And Lauren Weber at The Washington Post says it's not just that this virus can spread. It can really take you down. About one in five unvaccinated people in the U.S. who contract it end up hospitalized. Uh, For unvaccinated babies, about one in 600 develop a fatal neurological complication that can lie dormant for years. I mean, there's just some scary side effects. What's made the outbreak at Manatee Bay different is the way public health authorities have responded to it. There's a protocol most officials follow when they're facing measles. The Centers for Disease Control has a whole library of reference documents that any health department can access, including template letters to school principals, letters to physicians, letters to parents. These documents all encourage the same thing, getting as many kids vaccinated as possible, which is because the measles vaccine is so effective it can prevent infection even if a child's already been exposed. But that's not the kind of letter that Florida Surgeon General Joseph Latipo sent out. That letter uh, took a turn from what public health officials uh, would normally do and has been widely decried because that letter did not encourage parents with unvaccinated children to get their child vaccinated. And on top of that, it also left it up to the parents on if their unvaccinated child, who would be more likely to be susceptible to measles and then more likely to spread it if they contract it, to come back to school. If I read this letter, I would have no idea that there was a way to potentially prevent my kid from getting sick. Like, it just says, watch your kid for symptoms, as opposed to, hey, there's a way to actually forestall this illness if you want. You know, John P. Moore, who's a professor of microbiology and immunology at Weill Cornell Medical College, told me, look, you know, there's a reason why there's a measles outbreak in Florida schools, and it's because too many parents don't have their child protected by the measles vaccine. And he said, quote, and why is that? It's because anti-vaccine sentiment in Florida comes from the top of the public health food chain, Joseph Latipo. It's not just Florida that's experiencing this surge in measles. We've got double the number of cases there were this time last year in the United States. And the number's low. It's like 35, but it's it's there. How worried should all of us be at this point about measles? I think it's one of those things where it depends on your community because measles is is something that thrives in pockets of the U.S. that have lower vaccination uptick. But this is where I think it's important to note that Unfortunately, vaccine uptake 
among kindergartners um, is decreasing. You need to have a vaccine uptake of about 95% to be pretty protected from it. And frankly, a lot of communities just don't have that. Today on the show, why Florida's measles problem is actually a problem for the rest of us, too. I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next? Stick around. This episode is brought to you by Discover. When it comes to your finances, Discover wants you to know they are the credit card that is always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We are talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Let's meet our expert. Hi, I'm Ian Khan. I'm a technology futurist, speaker, and author, and I love to help organizations measure their current state of readiness for an AI-driven world. I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, our finance team is top-notch, but small. How can AI support them? Signed, Financially Drained. Well, Financially Drained, a lot is happening in finance and AI, and the possibilities are endless. First of all, AI can help your finance team analyze massive amounts of financial data faster than any human or a team of people could do. Second, it can help perform functions on data through algorithms. This can connect different systems together and really simplify decision-making for your finance team. And last but not least, AI can help reduce the time needed for data to provide insights so that your leaders can make faster decisions. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. Okay, I'm hoping we can just explain some basics about measles. So given the fact that measles is spreading, it seems like it's spreading in a different kind of way than it has in previous years, maybe more widely. How infectious is this disease? So measles virus particles can linger in the air and on surfaces for up to two hours after an infected person leaves the area. And up to 90% of people without immunity will contract it if exposed. So, you know, I know we all became a little bit more aware of virus particles lingering in the air with COVID, but this is so much more infectious than COVID virus lingering in the air. It's also infectious like four days before you get a rash from it. So it's like you may not even know you're able to spread it. Yes. And four days after you have the rash. That's why you oftentimes with measles alerts, you'll see things from the health officials being like, if you were at the Walmart from 8 to 10 a.m. on Sunday, February 10th, you may have been exposed to measles. And that's a real threat to you, which I mean, that sounds wild to think that you could be walking down a grocery store and encounter something like that. But that is the reality when it comes to measles outbreaks like this. But, you know, the vast majority of Americans are protected from the measles vaccine. Many, many, many people are vaccinated. But the threat is, is when you it comes across pockets of people um, who, for religious or other reasons, are not vaccinated. And also, newborns, they don't recommend that children get a measles shot until they're at least a year old. So folks that are under a year old are vulnerable to this as well. All of this argues for a pretty aggressive approach to managing measles. But I want to talk about what's happening in Florida instead and why. Florida's response is being managed by the state surgeon general, Joseph Latipo. So who is Joseph Latipo? How did he get here? So Joseph Latipo is a Harvard-educated physician. Um, My colleague Dan Diamond wrote a great piece about him two years now ago at this point that by all accounts was a a pretty run-of-the-mill guy for a long time. You know, he supported the ACA. He you know, did research. And then around 2019 and 2020, things started to shift. He 
began to write during the pandemic a bunch of op-eds in the Wall Street Journal decrying mass mandates and lockdowns and so on that caught the eye of Governor Ron DeSantis, who eventually brought him in to be Florida's state surgeon general. And ever since then, he's continued to take really contrarian health positions. On top of that, he's also really engaged with um, fringe right-wing groups that you just do not see state health officials engage with. He appeared on Stu Peters' uh, talk show, who's a conservative right-wing talk show host who's previously called for Anthony Fauci to be hung. I mean, he has appeared on Del Bigtree's podcast, who is a prominent anti-vaxxer. I mean, it's he really has taken a contrarian um, view on vaccines uh, through his his work on talking about how he opposes the mRNA COVID vaccines in his state and now, you know, not promoting vaccines for measles. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look up video of Latipo, he seems so affable. But then <laughs> you consider the words he's saying and where he's appearing, like he's called the COVID vaccine, for instance, the antichrist of all products. Frankly, I think it probably does have some integration at some levels with the human genome because these vaccines are honestly, they're, they're the antichrist of all products. So I think it probably and does. And he's called his anti-vaccine crusade part of God's plan. You know, it's just complete disrespect to the human genome and the importance of protecting it and preserving it. And that is our connection to God. This is pretty extreme stuff for a medical leader to be saying. I mean, his complaint about the COVID mRNA vaccine talked about contaminating patients' DNA, which, you know, every medical expert that myself and Dan Diamond talked to just roundly called scientific nonsense. You know, we have 50 state public health officials. You do not see any of them coming out with statements remotely close to this. And I would be very surprised to see um, them handle a public health measles outbreak in particular in a similar way. Yeah. Latipo's guidance around measles, just to be clear, he doesn't explicitly recommend vaccination in his letter to parents. And he also doesn't recommend keeping kids home if they're not vaccinated. He leaves it up to the families. And those are the two things that most public health officials have zeroed in on as problematic. Is that right? That's exactly right. I mean, I, a public health official told my colleague, Lena Sun, that it verges on medical malpractice because it is so different than what the accepted public health norm would be. Yeah. I mean, one thing that a writer at The Atlantic pointed out, which I thought was really interesting, was that Surgeon General Latipo has been offering contrarian advice about vaccines for years at this point. But it doesn't actually seem to be moving the needle in Florida. Like in 2022, Latipo actively urged kids not to get vaccinated against COVID. But by the end of that year, vaccination numbers for Florida kids actually went up. And they went up by the same amount that they did na nationwide. So I guess I wonder, do you think his guidance is making a difference? Like, does it matter that he isn't being as explicit as other public health officials would want him to be? I think that's an interesting stat. I think in general, someone who is the face of public health in a you know, the third most populous state in the country does matter when they take such a contrarian stance because other folks in other states can point to it and say, look, you know, I agree with the Florida Surgeon General X, Y, Z. Um, you know, most people go to their pediatrician. You know, your most trusted source for information is your doctor. And I am sure the vast majority of doctors in Florida disagree with Latipo's guidance and so are not advising in that way. But, you know, for a different statistic, the booster rate in Florida for COVID vaccine, it does lag the rest of the country. Hmm. And so the, the former Florida Surgeon General pointed out, who was also appointed by Ron DeSantis, that there were more than 8,000 COVID deaths in Florida last year, and those could likely be vaccine preventable. And so that's where words like latipos matter. You could argue, too, I think, that words matter more to potential patients 
when they're dealing with a very specific outbreak in their very specific school. Like, I might not pay attention to what Latipo is saying about COVID vaccination more generally, but I might be very interested in what Latipo has to say if my kid's in elementary school and there's an outbreak there. And so in some ways, this may be one of the first moments where his advice could move the needle and not necessarily in a way that keeps kids safer. Well, and we also are seeing that this advice, this kind of, you know, you decide if you want to be quarantined or isolated, is something that is reflective of the conservative and libertarian backlash to public health policies during COVID. You know, we saw a massive legislative and litigious backlash to the lockdowns and to various public health mandates. And clearly he is following that to some extent here. After the break, how what's happening in Florida is just one example of the way conservative ideas are reshaping the way public health works. This episode is brought to you by Rocket Money. Do you ever feel like money's just flying out of your account and you've got no idea where it's going? It is all those subscriptions. Think about it. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, it is endless. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills. You can see all of your subscriptions in one place. If you see something you don't want, you can cancel with a tap. You never have to get on the phone with customer service. They'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple of months. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money will take care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash whatnext. That's rocketmoney.com slash whatnext. Rocketmoney.com slash whatnext. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies, all lined up and ready to compare. So it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states and situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Lauren Weber told me that even though there are just three dozen measles cases nationwide right now, that's actually pretty high for this time of year. And given how easily measles spreads... Experts she talks to are worried we could see many more cases soon. So I wanted to know, why is that? Lauren, is it fair to say that you blame COVID and the fallout from COVID for the current measles surge we're seeing in the U.S.? I don't necessarily think I blame it. I think that many of the experts I have talked to would say that is contributing to it. You know, there's a lot of concern among many of the public health experts, legal experts, medical experts that I talk to, that the distrust towards vaccination and public health efforts that really grew during COVID is now spreading into vaccine-preventable childhood diseases that could cause a resurgence of things that we haven't seen in quite some time and unnecessary deaths. I mean, you've mentioned that non-medical vaccine exemptions for kindergartners went up in 41 states last year. 
Is anyone trying to figure out why? Like doing the digging, talking to those parents, or even just looking at the forms they submit to try to puzzle it out? From the folks I have talked to, a lot of it is attributed to growing skepticism around vaccine that has been fanned by anti-vaccine groups that saw the skepticism that started during the COVID pandemic because of a newer vaccine. And we're seeing that effect throughout the country. You know, you're seeing that in state houses. You're seeing more legislators get elected that uh, are questioning vaccine mandates and encouraging vaccine exemptions. You know, in Iowa, they took off the books last year a law that required schools to teach about the HPV vaccine. Huh. That vaccine prevents cancer. Yes, it does prevent cancer. And actually, it it prevents cancers that are growing in Iowa. Uh, In Tennessee, they passed a law that homeschoolers do not need to be vaccinated. They don't have a vaccine requirement. Can you lay out for me the way COVID may have empowered individuals and organizations to do the work of going into state houses and actually kind of calcifying their anti-vaccine point of view in state law? Like, how are you seeing that with legislators, with interest groups kind of pushing the needle here? Yeah, I I just published an investigation last week that, that dove into this a little bit. I found that by going through the tax records of four major nonprofits that rose to prominence during the pandemic by capitalizing on the spread of medical misinformation, that they gained collectively more than $118 million between 2020 and 2022. Wow. And those funds enabled these groups to testify in state houses, to build um, chapters of folks across the country that could then testify for them in state houses or influence legislatures. Um, as well as to build media campaigns to to get more grassroots folks that would then show up in state houses. Do we know where that money's coming from? You know, from what I could figure out from the tax records, the vast majority of it is coming from contributions and donations. You know, contributions and donations to nonprofits are not required to be made public. But if a nonprofit gives to another nonprofit amounts over 5000 you can see that. And I did find a few um, nonprofits and foundations and donor-advised funds that gave to these groups, some of whom had conservative or religious leanings. Uh, And, you know, when asked about the donations to these groups, they said their donors had directed the funds to these folks. Have you spoken to any lawmakers or maybe people who work in schools who are kind of watching all this happen? and? feeling concerned, but maybe unsure what to do about it? You know, I spoke to Fred Mills in Louisiana, who is the retiring Republican chairman of Louisiana's Louisiana's Senate Health and Welfare Committee, who for years had kind of been the guy standing in the way of a lot of anti-vaccine policies. You know, he'd been in office for 13 years, okay, before he retired this January because he was term loaded out. And, you know, for years, there'd obviously been, you know, some some anti-vaccine policies that had kind of come across his desk that had been pretty easy to, to swat aside. But once COVID started, he said it, it was just nonstop. And he really had to fight hard to keep, you know, these folks from getting some of this stuff through. But he turned out this year and his position was taken by an ultra conservative who's endorsed by a group, Stand for Health Freedom, that is fighting for Um, vaccine exemptions. And, you know, his takeaway is politics is going to win over medicine. Hmm. You know, I think some people would listen to our conversation and say, there have been outbreaks of measles that were pretty big before COVID. Like in 2019, there was an outbreak of 1,200 cases in the U.S., way bigger than what we're looking at right now. It was driven by the unvaccinated And like it had nothing to do with this surge of money or surge of interest post coronavirus. Why are you sure that something different is happening this year? We've never seen a state surgeon general not encourage vaccination, not tell kids to stay home from school. You know, these are different 
times, we did not have that high of a rate of childhood exemptions. So you're confronting a different reality on the ground here five years later. And that is why public health officials are very, very concerned. You know, you know, you noted previous outbreaks, you know, I think it was in 2022 at this point, Ohio had an outbreak of, I believe it was 85 measles cases. And what they couldn't do is because Republican legislation had passed, um, taking away their ability to order quarantines, they could not order that folks quarantine for measles. You know, their public health powers have been stripped in that way. There are other states across the country that have similar stripping of public health authority that could come to bear in these measles outbreaks that are popping up across the country. It is a different United States that is confronting this new threat of measles in this year. I have one more question for you. I know you've been doing so much reporting on vaccines, on measles, on infectious diseases. I'm wondering, do you ever hear from readers about what you've written? I have heard from readers about what I've written. What do they most want to tell you? You know, we got an insane amount of comments on that story. We wrote on this, um, the story I wrote with Lena Sun, uh, and one reader actually emailed her to say that he had gotten measles when he was seven years old. His temperature spiked to 105, and he was taken to the hospital with pneumonia. And this reader, whose name is John Cross, who's from Urbana, Illinois, said, the nurses gave me ice baths to get my temperature down, quote, a memorable experience, and huge injections of penicillin in the hips. It was very unpleasant, but I did survive. I missed over six weeks of school, and it was difficult to catch up. Of course, the measles vaccine wasn't yet invented when I got the disease in 1954. You can bet I wished it had been invented before then. When you hear from readers like that, I'm just wondering how you think about it as a journalist, sort of watching this whole other thing play out in a place like Florida. I think stories like this are so important to contextualize. You know, I interviewed a, a potential candidate for office who said to me, we don't have a lot of measles anymore. Why do we, why do we need vaccines? People forget. They do not remember because they were either not alive or they did not experience or because public health hasn't made it clear enough to them that the measles vaccine saves kids from having the same experience that John Cross did in 1954. Um, It saves kids from death, from hospitalization, from horrible outcomes. But people have forgotten. You know, this is not a common everyday experience. Most physicians have never seen a case of measles. When a vaccine is so successful that people forget about what it actually means to get the disease, then it becomes easier, some public health experts believe, to reject the need for it. Lauren, I'm really grateful for your time and your reporting. Thanks for coming on the show. Lauren Weber is a Washington Post accountability reporter. And that's the show. If you are a fan of what we're doing here at What Next, the best way to support us is to join Slate Plus. It's our membership program. Go on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to find out more. What Next is produced by Paige Osborne, Elena Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Anna Phillips, and Madeline Ducharme. We are led by Alicia Montgomery with a little boost from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you back here next time. I'm Dahlia Lithwick, and I'm host of Amicus, Slate's podcast about the law and the U.S. Supreme Court. We are shifting into high gear, coming at you weekly with the context you need to understand the rapidly changing legal landscape. The many trials of Donald J. Trump, judicial ethics, arguments and opinions at SCOTUS. We are tackling the big legal news with clarity and insight every single week. New Amicus episodes every Saturday, wherever you listen.